was. Um, yes, there's much to discuss here, and I want to move it right to, to the discussion. Um, there will, of course, be a small drink reception right afterwards, um, thanks to Healing Across the Divide, and you'll get to hear more about them um, at that reception. Um, also, um, um, the folks from One Voice Movement and Open Hill, um, uh, college students who want to gather to discuss further and connect, um, uh, raise your hand, uh, meet with this guy right here and uh, he'll, he'll bring you all together. Um, I think this is actually a great film to have a uh, college discussion, university discussions about. Um, uh, and folks, if you have tickets to the next film that's going on downstairs, we'll make sure you get out in time, so worry not. This actually will give a little more time for conversation. Please welcome um, the director of the film, Maya Zinstein. Maya, thank you. And as mentioned, she'll be moderated by Ms. Noah Landau um, from Haaretz. Um, these are the Haaretz postcards that give you the free subscription, and I put some right outside here. Um, over to you. Yes, please uh, take a free uh, subscription to our website, uh, Haaretz.com. So, good evening. It was very powerful, so, um, you know, we need to take a second to uh, process all of this. Um, before we begin, I just want to say that uh, Maya is a dear friend, and uh, she used to work for Aretz as an investigative journalist. Um, she does have a lot of experience in film. Uh, she used to be a producer. Um, she also studied film, but uh, later in her career, she became an investigative journalist. And the question is, how did you suddenly decide to be a film director after so many years in production uh, and as a journalist? And why this movie suffer from all the issues? So I guess, first of all, good evening to everybody and thank you for coming. I'm very happy to be here on the other Israel Film Festival and I want to thank them. They also supported the film and they also brought me here and Forever Pure, so thank you, Isaac. <laughs> So I guess I dreamed for many years and to become a director. I did many jobs around it, but it took me a while to actually go and do that. Um, and to this story, I came really actually by accident. I, I has been asked uh, by an Israeli television to make a story about the Chechen when they arrived. So I was the first person that they met when they landed in Israel. Um, we found that three of us were in the car and nobody of us knew <laughs> what's, going, what's going to happen. So I, that's why I spent with them the first four days in Israel and I saw the hate and I was just shocked. Like the first training that you saw in the film, for me it was shocking. Even though everybody, knows, everybody in Israel knows about Beitar Jerusalem, everybody knows that it's much beyond uh, football. When you're a Beitar fan, it says a lot about you. Um, it's your identity, it's your ideology. Um, it's your, usually actually it's also your social level. Um, but for me, to seeing that from so close, it was, I, I was really couldn't understand <laughs> why they hate them so much. And uh, after four days, this story has been shown on television, but, under, but I understood that the real story has ex actually just begun because I knew that they're going to stay till the end of the season. Um, so I decided uh, to keep going by myself with my amazing cameraman, um, just to go into this. And actually, I have to say that I was sure that I'm going to, um, to make a film with a happy ending. I know. <laughs> After watching the film, it's quite hard to believe. But from the point um, at the beginning, even though it looked so bad, I think still nobody could believe that it will went so bad towards the end. I can tell you that chairman, the chairman, it's a corn fine, told me after two weeks, told me, you will see after a few weeks, they will score some goals, everything will be fine, the fans will come back. So it's not just me that was naive. It also, I think, all the people that was in the club and actually knew this club for so many years couldn't believe how uh, powerful the, um, the La Familia 
these days in this club. Well, maybe I'm optimistic, but maybe it's not the end. It was the end of the movie, but we don't know, you know, what will be the real end. Of well, I, I don't, it depends what you consider as the end. <laughs> but uh, I can tell you that now, actually, um, after, so I filmed it on 2012, 2013, and now three years later, uh, the situation with La Familia is quite amazing. They totally controlling the club, the new owner, in a way, because of this season, and because everybody learned how much power they have. So in a way, also La Familia learned how much power they have. I think everybody, were, also the La Familia were surprised uh, how effective <laughs> the boycott was. Uh, so the La Familia understood that they're really powerful, but also the new owner understood that they have this huge power, and he's a businessman, he's an Israeli businessman, and he wants the fans will come to the stadium. So today, they totally controlling the club, and actually, two months ago, 50 members of La, La Familia were arrested um, in, in some different charges. Uh, some of them were arrested for attempt to murder and for holding weapons. Um, so, and I think another thing that happened to the La Familia is that after the season, suddenly we can see them not only in the stadium. Today, on every uh, right-wing uh, protest, you can see La Familia with their T-shirt. T-shirts. They are today they are playing on the political ground. So they came out of the stadium and they now moving forward. So I don't know what would be the end and. <laughs> when it will happen, but as it looks now, uh, nobody actually, I think it, 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 it just became a monster that nobody knows how exactly to, to deal with that. And you actually, uh, you know this monster much beyond the movie, right? Um, we didn't yes. actually see on the screen everything that happened between you and La Familia while you were shooting this film. Yeah, so um, actually the thing that happened between me and the La Familia happened when I was editing the film. So we released uh, 10 minutes on the Guardian website um, a year ago. Like it's the same like a New York Times Opdox. Um, and it went quite crazy. It got two and a half million views. And I started to get threats from the La Familia. They also threatened my mom and it went really serious and, and, and for me it was the first moment that I understood how these players actually felt during the season uh, while they were telling me, listen, we just cannot do anything. It's, it, when they are threatening you, it's so, it, it, it's so difficult. So, so I was sitting in London editing uh, the film and on the same time finding myself part of this film, it was, yeah. So what actually happened in the end? How did you resolve this? I'm still this? here. You, you, you went and you actually met them, right? Yeah. I, I'm happy you are. <laughs> but you, you actually went and yes. you confronted them. Um, yes. So I, I got some uh, advice um, from a great uh, organization that also supported us uh, when we got this, when I started to get these threats and I really didn't know what to do. Um, and she told me, one of these uh, people from this organization, she told me, you should go and meet them and speak with them. I told her, no, you're not negotiating with kidnappers. She said, oh, you're so Israeli, and of course you are. <laughs> and actually, it was a great idea. Um, I came back to Israel, and I went to meet a small group of them. And uh, it was an interesting conversation because uh, they were assuming some things about me. They just they didn't know who am I. They just saw my picture and from how I look, uh, my picture was spread all over the Facebook with uh, tech, with messages, this leftish rich bitch from Ramat Aviv. Um, and I was telling them, listen guys, I'm an immigrant. And do you want, I'll tell you how hard my parents working. So if you want to compare who had a more difficult childhood, you, like I will win. <laughs> and, and on the moment that I started to speak with them, and at the end they told me, well, you're a great man. And, uh, <laughs> um, but 
and also I also I told them don't you dare to threat my mom because if someone would threat your mom what would you do and he said well they said well we will I said yeah so don't mess with me too <laughs> I know it looks really funny when I'm sitting here wearing pink. Um, but I just look nice. <laughs> so, um, as you can see, you mentioned that you're an immigrant. And uh, as we can see in the movie, you uh, interview some of the people in Russia. And you came from Russia to Israel. Um, but um, in the movie, the La Familia, they are, of course, they are also the center of the movie. But they're not only the only ones who are pulling the strings. It's very obvious that the politicians in Israel also had a big part in shaping Beitar Yerushalayim to what it is today. Um, do you think that it's still going on? How do you think politicians can actually change the situation? Will they? Well, f for me, it was really important to keep this level, to bring into the film this political level. Because I do believe that nobody is born racist, right? These fans are the product of the society where they live. And there's people that are responsible for this society. And there's people that actually created this monster while letting to this club to become the only football club in Israel that has never signed an Arab player. So it's not only the fans. And for me, all of, I think that... Uh, our leaders that kind of approving by their silence uh, all the things that happening um, they, they're much more responsible in a way responsible than the La Familia um, uh, the La Familia member because that's well that's how it works so uh, yeah I, I can tell I can give you a great example of how it works so our Minister of Culture Miri Regev um, she's from the Likud party, and of course she's uh, recognizing herself as a Beitar fan. All of them know that the way to the parliament, if you're from the right wing, the way to the parliament goes through Teddy Stadium. Um, so all of them kind of from time to time visiting in the games and taking pictures with the fans. So Beitar went to play in Europe, I think... Uh, one season after the season that we saw, and the fans just acted terribly. They they just blow up, it blow up the game in Charleroi in Belgium, and it became it lots of like it was covered by the press and and everybody said in Israel also that is how the hell we look in the world with this kind of uh, acts. And then Miri Regev tried to say something, and in five minutes her picture hugged with members of La Familia with t-shirts of La Familia was all over the internet. And I know the person from La Familia that actually did it. And he told me, what the hell? Like she comes to my stands, takes pictures with me, and then she speaks against me. No way, like if you're with us, you're, you're with us. And, and, and after that, Miri, nega, Miri never spoke against Beitar anymore. And she won't speak because this is her political base. So I, I think that example is, and, and also the, the reaction of Netanyahu that you saw in the film, is the only thing that Netanyahu said about this story during all these crazy four months. So, and if he considers himself as a, as a Beitar fan, I think as a prime minister, he has a huge responsibility for kind of give much more uh, powerful reaction. So before we uh, start with questions from the audience, um, I just wanted to ask one uh, uh, last question. Um, when we s you see such a movie, it probably as you know, it, some people feel like they need to do something, you know, to take action. And um, what do you think, where this movie you think can actually go forward now? Um, so, you know, some people just see the movie and then they go out and go home and maybe they think about it, maybe they don't. Do you think your movie maybe has a place in, um, Educating younger people, yeah, younger soccer fans. Yeah, very much. I do think that this film is um, is a great way to show how racism can destroy a team or a society from within. Um, so I do see it, see this film as, as something very powerful. Also because it just tells that through this amazing game that is soccer. So I think it's very not didactic. 
you know, no, it, you're, nobody says, oh, racism, it's bad. You just see that, <laughs> how bad it is. And, and I do thinking and I'm looking for um, opportunities how to take this uh, film and, and make of it an educational tool because it's not only an Israeli problem. We, yeah, that story has been happened to be in Israel, but I think we see racism in sport and racism as a general idea in a few places in the world. <laughs> For sure. So now we'll take some questions from the audience. What, what were the uh, owner's objectives in bringing the pliers to the team? And it's the second part of the question, did the owner, how supportive was the owner of your making the film? I'm not, I'm sorry, I'm not sure that I understood the first part, the first well, part. What were the owner's objective in bringing the pliers? Because he said oh. it was to create the reaction, which didn't sound, didn't seem rational. Yeah. Um, so, first of all, I have to say for me as the filmmaker, Arkady Gainamak was an amazing character. Um, because he was very honest. And I, as a, as a filmmaker, I love honest uh, characters. Um, I do think, that, and he says it actually in the film, uh, there was the, the motivation was a combination of he really angry about Beitar. So this man came to Israel and really put it crazy money, not only in Beitar, brought them twice to uh, take the championship and win um, and go to Europe and then uh, because he he did all this because he has been told that if he will, he would be an owner of Beitar he can be, become the mayor of Jerusalem, and then this man gets three point six percent of the votes, and he's quite angry after that, and and it was definitely so was it revenge yeah yeah it was it was a revenge of him he knew exactly what he's doing again like the way that it was released it was a, a provocation because um just the chairman knew about this move from the new, from the press that's crazy right so and the way that he was it was announced gaidamak signed two muslims in beitar jerusalem and everybody knew what will happen when you kind of making this move in in such in a such way so that was one uh, part and the second part he's a businessman and he's doing business with the church and president the church and president tries to clean his problematic image in the world, he's doing it through sport. Um, and uh, for him, it's a great way that suddenly the Chechen president is the one that's putting the Chechens and the, the Muslims and the Jews together. So it's just a combination of, of, of one person that really wants to... Um, power and power. Yeah, power and power, power and money, yeah. What has been the reaction to the film in Israel and have the people from Beitar or anybody associated with them seen it and what did they have to say? So um, our world premiere was in Jerusalem Film Festival. Actually, it was really important for me um, to start the route of this film in Jerusalem and first to show it to people that it's made about them. And it went quite well. We got three prizes for best directing, best editing, and uh, also mentioned from Yad Vashem, which was very unique for me, uh, to get a special mention from Yad Vashem. Uh, they found this film very important um, for what happens today in Israel. And um, so it's still a festival. It hasn't been re widely released yet in Israel, so I don't know what would be the reaction on the wide audience. Uh, I hope it won't be like it happened. What happened with the Guardian thing? <laughs> uh, but I can tell you that people from Beitar that came and 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 watched the film, they told me you're just showing in hundred percent exactly what happened, and that's amazing. And for me as a filmmaker, that's just a great thing to hear because these people were there, and if I'm succeeding to to bring to uh, the screen. Um, and they are proving it in a way that it's exactly what happened. So it's, for me, it's great. Him, he's the one that is signing. Hi. Um, so you talked a little bit about um, Netanyahu's response, but I was really interested in Rivlin's response because he talked about the importance of Beitar for coming into power as a right-wing leader, 
but he has taken a really different approach to racism. So I wonder what he's been saying through those four months and what was his role? So Rivlin, um, Re we'll just say the president. yeah, the president of Israel, the president of Israel, he's a huge fan of Beitar. Uh, for many, many years. He's not going anymore for the stadium because of what happens in Beitar for the last 20 years, but he told me as a secret that he still watches all the game at home. <laughs> um, he did react, especially after the sign Forever Pure. Um, he reacted and today he also very, uh, he's working a lot on this, um, on this issue of of uh, racism in sport. He came to the premiere in Jerusalem. Um, I guess it was his way uh, to show that this film is very important. Uh, we were the only film that he uh, came to watch in the Jerusalem Film Festival. And um, yeah, I, I really, actually I have, you know, I have many ideas. For me, for example, I have a dream to make a special screening in Israel for all the youth clubs um, of all the clubs in Israel uh, and that Rivlin will come and talk to them. So that's kind of ideas. It's just related to what Noah asked, what I can do, uh, well, how I want to use it. So in a way to, to make also these kind of events and, and I think I, I don't want to speak in the name of the president, of course, but I do think that uh, he's, he would be quite supportive. He was supportive till now. It seems to me that the audience were more Ashkenazis, no, Sephardic than Ashkenazis. Can you speak to that? Yeah, it, that's very true. So Beitar Jerusalem always uh, was the club. Uh, I'm telling it in a very short way on the beginning, uh, but that was uh, uh, the club of the second Israel. I don't know if you know this. Um, that That's how the right wing was considered for many years when Israel was established. And yes, a lot of fans of Beitar, they are originally from uh, Arab countries, Mizrahi Jews. And, uh, and I think that's also why it makes it so complicated because for me it's what always this, this one of the fans when he says, when you see a dark skinned man goes to the bus and everybody is losing heartbeat, but when like, when you're just looking at him, <laughs> They just, he just looks the same. And, and I think that, that these kind of small moments just showing how, how complicated that situation and, and why maybe it, it goes so bad. Um, it was such a powerful movie and I think I watched it with two parts of my brain. One part was looking at the horror that I saw in the Israeli society and the other is comparing it to what's happening right now in the United States. And this need for voices of moral authority, and I didn't see any voice of moral authority coming out in the film that was the counter voice to this very racist discourse. And I see the same thing happening now in the United States. Who is going to be a voice of moral authority? I don't know if you want to comment on that briefly, any parallels you might see. Alec Baldwin and Michael Moore, I think, are our voices right now. I'm, I'm, sure. I'm making jokes while you guys talk. No, 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 no. I'm just trying to to to, to make sure. Do you see any similarity between what's happening now in the U.S. and what you described in your? Well, film? I think that when you see this uh, small group that everybody says now, it's just a bunch of people. It's not. It's nothing, and that's what has been told about La, Fa La Familia for 20 years. Everybody were telling, no, they're just a small group of people, and it's, yeah, well, they're the extremists. And then suddenly you see uh, how this small part becomes, goes on the majority, and that suddenly these very extreme uh, beliefs becomes in the, like the major things that comes out of that club. So I do think that you can find some And maybe that's a warning, you think? For well, yes, I, I do think that this, as I said before, this film shows how racism destroys a team or a society from within. And it's, maybe it's about, it's shown in Israel, but it's, 
it's exists in so many places and, and I think it's a great metaphor for what can happen. And, and, in, and there's no redemption in the end because, because th that's, that's the reality. Uh, <clears throat> this film was sort of deja vu for me because I was around when the Brooklyn Dodgers signed Jackie Robinson. Mm -hmm. And what was going on in the, uh, with the fans all over the country, or at least that part of the country that had baseball, was uh, it took a while, and probably money was the determinant for the integration of teams throughout the country. But uh, to see this happening again was very traumatic to me. Can I, can I say something about that? Because I think there, there is a difference between what was when Jackie Robinson were signed and this situation. Because Jackie Robinson has been brought actually to make change, right? And he was chosen as also him as a character that could handle that. And it was a, uh, it was a very difficult path also for him. So, but and, and in a way, it has been made from the right reasons. And all the... Like all this story, the basics of that, maybe, maybe the idea is, well, I do think that Arab players should play in Bitar Jerusalem, but it, the, the motiv motivation behind this move was not the right motivation. And if you're doing it from the wrong reasons, it cannot succeed. So, so that's the, I think that that's the difference. Has there been any? Oh, has there been any interest from the Chinuch in uh, showing it in schools? Well, I'm I'm try I'm started to work on that. Uh, I I think um, for me, well, amazing things are happening to this film um, out of Israel. But for me, a um, very major goal is actually to succeed to bring it uh, in Israel to the Ministry of Education, to uh, make a community release, to go to schools and, and to, to screen it to as much as possible for like to the audience of uh, youth. Uh, I do think that my uh, main audience should be till 30 because, because that's the parts of, of, you know, that, that maybe still we can change their mind a little bit. So, yes. And in this country, I suggest that you get in touch, if you haven't, with the Southern Poverty Law Center because they are preparing teaching materials on teaching tolerance. Thank you. I'm just, uh, it was a wonderful film. Thank you um, very much. I uh, am curious about, uh, there wasn't any explicit mention of violence or the, the violent threats that the players may have received, um, what was their reaction to the threats? Uh, did they require bodyguards? Uh, you mean the Israelis? As they, as they lived through this. You, you mean the Israelis and, um, or the Chechens? I mean the, the Chechen players uh, was, and the Israeli players on the team who were blamed for accepting them and working with them. Uh, was it necessary to protect them, and what kind of actual uh, beyond was there any uh, subtext of violence that occurred uh, beyond the um, uh, what we saw? So, I think the the we saw what in a way the ma the most of the of, of the Israeli players just. Uh, Wait, just didn't say anything and hope that it will pass above their head. Um, and yeah, all of them were getting text messages from the fans. It's really important to understand what happened in this specific season. So more than 80% of the players at this season was local players, which means they grew up together with them and La Familia. It's their friends. So think what happened when your best friend suddenly turns against you. And, and, and it's so, the mother of the player goes to the market on Friday and then she meets the, the fans of, of La Familia that say, it's so, it's so, everything is so close. So um, we, do, we, we saw that there was 
two kind of reactions of Ariel Harush, the goalkeeper that tried to speak for um, for the Chechens. And this man, his life is destroyed. I can tell you today, I met him two months ago. This this guy, he still didn't get over that. He still, you start speaking with them about 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 this season, he has tears like it happens now. He never actually made it to Europe, even those on the middle of this particular season, he was a huge success and everybody was sure that on the next season he's going to play in Europe. It never happened. He never came back to be back what he was before. Um, and the fear Korea, yeah, he, well, he made a great career uh, for himself, so. And some of, the, some of the politicians as well. Made a great career. For yes. Themselves. Yeah. Um, and for the Chechen players, they were uh, uh, surrounded by bodyguards 24 hours a day. They stayed all these three months in the hotel. Um, yeah. So, but I can understand why uh, the club wanted to be on the safe side in this, yes. in that sense. We have one last question over here. Hi. I I appreciate your movie a lot. Thank you. I actually have two questions, kind of, just to, from your Israeli perspective. Do the, most Israelis equal Muslim and Arab the same? Because they call them Arabs when they're really Muslims, and they're Christian Arabs, too. So it's very kind of uneducated. Is that a majority thought that if you're a Muslim, you're an Arab, and it's the same? And the other part is, do the other teams that accept Arabs on their soccer team, and the population it has a lot of uh, left-leaning, liberal, non-racist people, how do they react to the games with Beitar? There are Arabs in the other teams. Well, first of all, Arab players playing in all the clubs in Israel, also in the national team. So in that sense, Beitar is very unique. Um, um, for your question about uh, the Muslim and the Arab issue. So actually, I tried to speak with the fans about that. And, and I think the answer is in the one of the Facebook posts that you saw in the... Um, in the film, they saying it starts in a Muslim and then to Arab and then another Arab and another Arab. So in a way they understand that there's a difference, but it doesn't matter. In a way they blocking in it, uh, and, and, and are, yeah, that's called racism. I'm sorry, and <laughs> just what it is, you know. Because for example, I can't and I can and. I, I'm talking with them about it because they have this kind of explanation. They're saying, you know, there's a clubs uh, that they're, for example, uh, Atletico Belbao in Spain, that they're accepting only Basques. I'm telling them, no, that's different. Because if Beitar was actually only Jewish team, so you decided, you know what, I can go with that. It's okay to have an only Jewish team, that only Jews play there, right? We can get this thing. But... In this club, Christians are playing there. So it's not Jewish club, it's a non-Muslim club. And then that's exactly the difference between uh, uh, having a representation as a, a particular group and, and racism. And, and there's a big difference between uh, these two things. Noah and Maya, thank you so much for this thank you really very much. riveting film and fascinating conversation. Folks, uh, learn more about Healing Across the Divides and our other partners. Um, uh, they uh, provided here um, uh, some drinks and an opportunity to talk a little more. Um, there's also, of course, many more films coming up this week. Please join us, especially The 90-Minute War. Don't miss that one um, coming up on Tuesday night. Thank you all. And the student discussion group is over here, the guy with his hands up. Thank you very much.